pretty dark. For Good one. evening, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Mitchell, and on behalf of the Stratum Heritage Commission, I'm really happy to welcome you here tonight for our Commission's 2017 program. As you are, I am sure, aware, last year Stratum celebrated its 300th anniversary of the official establishment of our town. Since the founding of a meeting house was a requirement for the legal establishment of a township, 2016 was also the 300th anniversary of the congregation known today as the Stratum Community Church. So 300 years ago, we had in place two pillars of the community, life, local government, and a church. Several months ago, however, it occurred to me that we really hadn't, uh, as we were doing our celebrations, we really hadn't properly recognized another institution that was vitally important to our town in its colonial era, inns and taverns. All right, I will have a few more remarks, and then Ron Dean is going to come up here and talk about the remarkable work he's doing at the Keniston Tavern. Marsha Smith Blaine, who is our guest speaker tonight, will talk about tavern history and culture and, his, and her research that was especially focused on women tavern keepers. Then I will close with some words about more modern times. So, before 17, between 1784 and 1792, Jeremy Belknap wrote his three-volume history of New Hampshire. It's hard to believe that in the 18th century, you know, somebody could write a three-volume history of New Hampshire, but this guy was comprehensive. <laughs> um, when Belknap wrote of the qualities of an ideal New Hampshire town, he could have been describing Stratton. Quote, were I to form a picture of a happy society, it would be a town consisting of a due mixture of hills, valleys, and streams of water. The land well fenced and cultivated. The inhabitants mostly husbandmen. Their wives and daughters domestic manufacturers. He goes on, but for our purposes tonight, it is important to note that right in the middle of this list of requirements of an ideal community, he stipulates the necessity of a, quote, a decent inn for the refreshments of travelers and for public entertainments. So he was very specific that an inn was, the tavern was an integral part of uh, life in a, in a healthy community. What you've all been sitting here looking at is actually a print of, a, of an 18th century English inn, but it bears likely a pretty close resemblance to what a New England uh, tavern would have been in the same year with a small bar, uh, I don't know whether we'd have that Natalie dressed soldier there, but um, a few other local characters, bottles, platters, or plates, and animals. And um, it's not that different from a kitchen scene in anybody's house at that time. It's a very domestic kind of setting. But, and I, but I want to digress a little bit too um, about uh, words, terminology. I'm far from an expert on this, and probably Marcia um, may have more to say, but you will find that in the early, uh, this early period, the same place might be called a variety of names, inn, tavern, public house, ordinary, and even strong water house, which is kind of my favorite. <laughs> but I will use the single word tavern, partly because if you say inn, people now think of some place where people go to spend the night. Um, so tavern kind of is more uh, descriptive. Um, of what we're talking about. So Stratum in the 18th and early 19th centuries was ideally suited for taverns. The road between Exeter and Portsmouth was one of the finest in the state, which might not have been saying much, but, um, <laughs> and very well traveled, enough to support several Greenland and Stratum taverns along its full length. In addition, the Stratum Ferry over there on the Squamscott and later the bridge crossing the Squamscot was heavily used by those journeying to and from the interior towns. Similarly, traffic to and from the seacoast passed along Winnicott or Winniconic Road, passing through the area of mills along the Winnicott River. One source lists 16 people from Stratum applying for tavern <coughs> licenses between 1716 and 1765. The first tavern keeper in Stratum may have been what is, was called one arm Ben Levitt. I don't know what the story is, how he lost his other arm, but maybe 
Somebody here has heard that story. He was called that by Richard Scanlon, whose 1899 article in the Granite Monthly is a prime source for Stratum history. Levitt appears to have received a tavern license in 1716. It was fairly common for people applying for travel for, uh, for licenses to run a tavern. Uh, they did it because they had some impairment that rendered them unfit for more strenuous occupations. So, for instance, in 1721, Jonathan Chase was granted a license because the selectman said his house was conveniently located for the town and he was also disabled and had no other means of providing for his family. That was also the case in 1748 when his son Thomas Chase applied for a license stating he was bodily infirm. Scammon also pro uh, reported there was a tavern at Winnicott Mills at what we know as the Jewel Peabody Farm at 173 Winnicott Road. According to provincial papers in 1745, David Jervil was granted a license living at, quote, Winnicott, where there was a sawmill, a gristmill, and a fulling mill. Some of these taverns uh, may have been fairly temporary, but, um, for instance, while Jonathan Wigan uh, had a license for a tavern there in 1721, somewhere along the line, somebody else applied for a temporary license to operate in the same house. So it could have been that Jonathan Wigan was, we don't know the whole story, maybe he was otherwise occupied and he, somebody stepped in. Furthermore, between 1716 and 1765, there were three Stratum women who applied for tra tavern licenses. Widow Hannah Wigan in 1749, Love Chase in 1760, and Sarah Boynton in 1760 also. She was keeping a tavern before that time because an ad for an auction of her late husband's blacksmithing tools names her as an inholder. Taverns in, in towns such as Stratum would have been almost indistinguishable from any other houses in town. The interiors would have been quite simply furnished. This is a kind of a recreation, but it gives you an idea of the simple unfinished tavern tables, uh, a little bar in the corner, a few things around, but pretty sketchy, nothing, uh, no fancy tablecloths, not much else going on. Perhaps the most popular drink was the flip. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the recipes for flip, but it was, it was pretty strong. <laughs> and I think we should be grateful that, that nowadays we're not having to pay for the selectmen's flips that they consumed uh, notoriously at Chase's Tavern when they met there. Punch, usually a rum-based drink, was also very popular. The common practice was to serve a small punch bowl, usually about eight to nine inches, uh, for a person or a table to share, and then men would pass the bowl around rather than ladling out into cute little cups the way we do today. This punch bowl, uh, now at the New Hampshire Historical Society, is about nine inches in diameter. It belonged to Payne Wingate here in Stratum. Um, this is a rather fancy Chinese export uh, variation of a punch bowl. So slightly more uh, fancy than would have been served in a tavern. Um, so tonight we're going to focus on particularly on two stratum taverns that were unquestionably the most well-known, most frequented um, in town. Uh, and both of them <coughs> remarkably are still standing today. So, and those are Chase's Tavern, I mentioned some of the Chase family earlier, and also Keniston's Tavern. Before I introduce Ron Dean to talk about his work at Keniston's Tavern, I'll give you a little bit of his early history. This house, which is shown here in a 1943 Rumford Press calendar, uh, scenes of New Hampshire, land of scenic splendor, um, was built in 1761 on eight acres of land that Ephraim Crockett sold to his son John. His farmlands are down up uh, where Jason Lane is and all that sort of stuff. And the Keniston Tavern, as you know, is on, on faces Portsmouth Avenue at the corner of Depot Road. Following year, 1762, John married Mary Lane, the firstborn of Samuel Lane and his wife, Mary. 
while uh, John and Mary Crockett increased their holdings to 20 acres by, 19, uh, by 1777, they had six children, and they were finding it difficult to feed and support six children on only 20 acres of land. So they moved to Northwood, where they could uh, farm more broadly than it seemed to be possible here in Stratton. A few years after the Crockett's left town, the house was bought by Henry Keniston, a tailor. And although the first legal record of Keniston operating at a tavern it was his license that was issued in 1803, the 1793 Phineas Merrill map locates Keniston's Inn. And that's how it looks today. And that its appearance today is due to the efforts of Ron Dean, who will be coming up here to talk about what he's been doing there. Ron Dean is an, a stratum antique dealer, art dealer, who operates his business, Dart Antiques, in his barn at the old Chase Dairy Farm on Chase Lane. Ron will tell you about his acquisition of the Keniston Tavern and his ongoing work preserving its historical features while also making it suitable for modern living. Ron has a whole evening's worth of slides, but he kindly consented to show this much shortened selection tonight, and we hope we can bring him back so that those of us who are interested in all the nitty-gritty can see everything that was going on there. Ron, will you come forward? Uh, this is the first, the oldest picture that I found of the, the, uh, the, the inn, the tavern. Uh, the funny thing is, it looks like they're pointing to this building, but the inn is actually right here. That was a, a different time. Um, that was before the road was paved. It was paved, I, I, I hear, in uh, about 1929. So I like to think this picture is about uh, 18, uh, 1917, so it's 100 years old. This is uh, another uh, postcard. Uh, the main reason for this is to show you the door that is no longer there. When I bought the place, it had a window up at the top. I uh, have no idea what it was for. People could make up their, their own uh, ideas. And this shows the uh, sign. This was uh, as I got it. <coughs> uh, you maybe remember the newspaper and the, the situation, everything. My wife told me to finish the one we were in before we went looking for another one. <laughs> and so we were working on that, but one day I got curious after having looked at the place, you know, what the price was at. And uh, I found out that it was at a price, I just wrote a check and bought it because it was not going to go away uh, and not going to last long at that rate. Uh, next. I don't know what it is about New England, but people love to pile their dirt up against the house and up against the foundation. I've had two places like this. So the first thing I did was start uh, cutting it down about a foot. This, uh, this shows out in the field, but it was actually up there. And I, I mean, it was up to this level, so you could see the, the main support was underground. And uh, no matter which you put there, uh, water gets through eventually. So that was the first project. And I know this is not true to form, not, uh, not exactly historically accurate, but this was all just field stone in here. And I wanted to keep the rodents out. So I got some more granite uh, to finish and did that all the way around the edge so that uh, I could keep the critters out. Uh, this is the uh, famous bifold door in the front. <coughs> I was working on the back of it today. Uh, it, you, I found out that today, looking at it, that it used to open on the right, now it opens on the left. Uh, whoever uses front doors on buildings anymore, he's <laughs> always coming to the kitchen or something. Next. Obviously, you needed insulation, so that came to the point. This part right here, somewhere right about in here on up, was the only original clapboard that was left. And I left it there. I didn't take it off. All of the other stuff was like number four pine or something. And it was curling and full of knots. It was horrible. So I was going to be when I started ripping that off. <coughs> this is a shot of the end. I snuck in a couple of new windows. Uh, the way I'm looking at this, all the things I'm doing on this place, I'm doing for the last time. Okay. So I've got a lead 
drip edge over the corner of the stone. I got ice and water shield, and then over this one, from black paper. You can see my marks here where the studs were. <laughs> trying to trying to get nails to go into things. And oh, suddenly it's finished. Right? Look at that. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> that. Hey, slide that in. I tell you. Uh, here you can see the part that was saved. Yeah. I replaced it with Vermont hemlock. And I did about five nails and realized I was going to have to drill a hole for every nail. So that's what I did. That's, you wonder, it took me so long? Okay. Right. But uh, that's the last piece. See those old trucks come in handy. Okay. Could I ask a question? No. <laughs> Why were the windows six followed by eight on top? I have no idea. But you did copy that back. They were the window. Were, uh, those are the windows. Those are the windows that were there, to be honest. Oh, yeah. I just did with that. What style of house do you know? Do you know? George. George. Yeah, George. 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 It was built in 1761. If it wasn't for this young lady, I would be a year behind. <laughs> and if she hadn't decided to go to college and be a Mormon missionary in Brazil, I would probably be finished. <laughs> but she is amazing. I'm sure many of you have gone by there and seen her out there working. She does everything and she loves it. Uh, this is the, uh, the threshold that was there. I don't know whether it was original, but uh, she was putting it in place. <coughs> And some of you driving by might have seen my uh, my survey. I had a number of people comment, uh, okay, which color should it be? You know? And uh, you can see what it wound up. Interestingly enough, many of these houses remained unpainted for many, many decades. Um, so. Yeah, that, getting down to the original color was hard to tell because the, the stuff had been removed. There's some of the trim was original. That's the old kitchen and the new kitchen. I don't know what else there is to say. <laughs> this is the upstairs now. This is the uh, dance room or master bedroom. Or this is as it was when I got it. All this, this beautiful baseboard heating. <laughs> Wallpaper. The guy that uh, occupied that room for 25 years was a chain smoker. Oh. I understand he had one in one hand and one started in the other. So I'll show you a picture of what that resulted in. Not him, but... <laughs> uh, you can see the ceiling. The whole, uh, this door, if anybody here borrowed that during the world of soul, I'd like it back. Uh, that's a hard one to replace, but uh, somebody apparently walked off with it. Uh, so that, that's before anything had really started happening in there. And this is the ceiling, or the, you know, the roof of that, uh, ceiling of that room. You can see the arched uh, angle there. And the thing that got me, I was, I was wondering, said, okay, now did they build that room originally like that? Or uh, is this a salvaged beam? It's probably salvaged, because I'm thinking, gee, if they built that as a standard ceiling, and then in the, you know, put the, the late 1700s, they remodeled the house and raised the ceiling. I don't know. But uh, this had, does have notches in it, so it was probably salvaged from another structure. This is nicotine. Oh. And you can see there's a lot of nice detail. But uh, this shows, this, this here, I've counted 13 layers of paint. That was in the kitchen. This is up in the, the, the other. Um, the ballroom, hallway, or one of the doors, I think it had nine or ten layers. Great fun. <laughs> this is the living room. As I got it, started taking down the stuff that people put up over the years. Uh, discovered some interesting wallpaper. Uh, that beam was there because a room had, well, it's a long story. I don't think I have time. Well, okay. uh, the, the, the fireplace was rebuilt in the 60s, and the nitwit that did it put it skiwampus instead of leaving it square. So that left the main beam going from the front and back of the house with no support. So, and then I guess in the meantime, they tore out a room. You can see right here, and there's also markings in the floor where there had been a thin bulb room. <clears throat> uh, so I replaced that and got rid of that beam. Uh, this is what it looks like a little bit more 
after uh, the uh, lath, the plaster was pretty well shot. It had actually been, been covered. I took it down and it was kind of this and that. The problem was that the lath, that the little animals have lived up there for many years, and as, as shown by the thousands of corn cobs that were up in there. And of course, they had their little corners for their potty. And so that meant that their sections of this lath was saturated. And I didn't want to sit in there watching American pickers smell. What's that small? <laughs> you know, so I took it down to replace the seat. Did they use horse hair? That's yes, absolutely. Uh, this is how we dated the place. We found this. Uh, now that's what they did. I, it's there and I look at it every day. Or I, does. I understand, I don't believe this from what I've looked at, but a piece of the paneling supposedly it was around this it might have been brought from upstairs i couldn't see where upstairs it might have been but i took it that the paneling down because they put some of it in upside down <laughs> i just so that's got to be redone and this is uh one of those fun things about the uh, construction see here where they cut literally oh, all the way no. through the beams no, no, to put plumbing no. in oh. <laughs> Uh, any oh. any uh, 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 yeah. inspection people here. <laughs> it's all been replaced. <laughs> and then, of course, the, this was all over the place. Then there were many things that were numbered. Windows were numbered. The seals on the outside was pretty cool. Now, horsehair plaster <laughs> has a tendency to move over the years. Windows leak. You can see right here, obviously, there was a leak and it came down. There were places where it was gone. There were places where it was just kind of hanging there, literally by the horsehair, because it had come loose from the lap. Well, good old Google, I looked on there and I found out what they do if you're serious about restoring place. Um, <clears throat> you gently push the stuff back in, you drill a hole, vacuum it out, get your caulking gun with glue, squirt it in there, and then you take a metal disc sheet wall screw and put it in and just pushes that right up against the lath, leave it for a couple of days, good as new. And I would defy anybody to go in there and find which was original and which is which was re-glued. <clears throat> this is the kitchen floor. It was the kitchen was basically redone because the, the walls and everything were just rotted. The place over here under the sink, the end of the beam had rotted off and a couple of spots up there by the back door where the moisture got in. Other than that, solid as a rock. I mean, it's really amazing how, how uh, tight and, and secure and strong everything was. <clears throat> I want to back up a second. Sure. I built these boxes around here, put in a again, to keep the critters out. Because this, this is, there's no crawl space here. It's a, you can let a cat in there, maybe. Okay, now I'm going to... And uh, I put in the rock saw insulation, uh, hex uh, tubing, the, my own made, homemade reflectors, <laughs> and uh, so I've got radiant uh, base, base heat, floor heat. Boy, you're, you want me to finish? I still have minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and she, they wanted me to show that. There, they're the controls. Okay, nice. Razzle dazzle, modern stuff. Uh, these are two windows. <laughs> With insulation, okay. A uh, little setback of the wall caved into the basement when they were trying to do the thing there. Had, uh, had that 24 foot span, the two corners were there, that beam never moved. <laughs> And I guarantee you now, with that house calls now, that wall is going to be standing. That's, that's in the basement now. Okay. <clears throat> This is the front stairwell. I spent the whole day in there today and yesterday, for that matter. Was it solid? Pardon? Was that solid? Solid, what do you mean? The banister. Oh, yeah. In other words, you couldn't Sturdy. wiggle it loose. It wasn't oh, oh, no, it's, oh, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. It's a little hollow because it, it goes in the This had horsehair plaster on it. Uh, the wonderful people that lived in there, rented it recently, uh, almost recently, tore it down. It exposed the paneling. They thought the paneling was better with the millions of nail holes in it. <laughs> I put the sheet rock back up. That's and here's the ballroom again with uh, some of the paint gone. <clears throat> and that's my treatment of the ceiling. Uh, I tried stripping the ceiling. 
I tried paint remover, I tried heat gun, I tried scraping, and the only thing I, that would work was finding was a, uh, a ceiling, two ceiling coats, and then a, uh, uh, just a, a dressing coat of uh, compound. And this is over this out here. This is all uh, wine plaster. Tried to try to do it. You know, I can't can't do everything, but that's it. <laughs> Can I ask a question? I've got a minute to spare. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> sir, was it your intention to restore the property <coughs> to, for example, upstairs? A lot of these uh, inns had a. Uh, uh, a place where people could dance and, and so was your intention to restore it in that direction or was it for you to bring it up, your intention to bring it up to modern use? I'm not having dances in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's got electrical, it's got plumbing, uh, you know, it's got heating. Uh, I mean, the room is there yeah. uh, for whatever it wants to be used for. So I think, I think that, um, what Ron has been doing, is, as I mentioned, is really what's more called the rehabilitation. He's done a great job preserving the key remaining historic characteristics of it, but he's rehabilitating it for contemporary use. And um, from, my, from my perspective, that's a totally valid way to go about this. This isn't a museum, it's, it, and the best way to preserve a place like this is often to make sure that it remains usable for contemporary life. And the upstairs, except for the, the two bathrooms that we put in, uh, where the stairs, back stairs used to come up, it's 100% it's the way it was. I mean, new paint and stuff like that, but uh, nothing else has changed. Well, there is a closet that we did that was around the fireplace. So. I'll hang around after if anybody has other questions. <laughs> Before we, we leave Kenison's Tavern, I'd, I'd like to read you a little bit from, from an article that appeared in the, um, the 1861 Portsmouth Herald. It's really a lovely little description of somebody reminiscing about what Kenison's Tavern was like under Henry Kenniston. It goes, that gentlemanly landlord passed, uh, passed away some 30 years ago, and since then the signboard has been taken down and his children there enjoy the quiet of domestic life. Goes on to recall that Keniston had a motto posted by the door that said, walk in gentlemen, sit down and take your ease, pay for what you call for, and call for what you please. Um, after uh, Keniston's death, there was an estate inventory that's in the probate records, and it lists a variety of bar equipment, <coughs> beds, linens, and kitchenware that exceeds in number the normal inventory for a single household. Also, there were a list of debts owed to the estate by local residents <laughs> that indicates both that this was a popular place for uh, stratomites, but also that Keniston was probably not entirely strict about applying the rule of pay for what you call for. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in the other, one other interesting uh, mention of this I found was from uh, a 1933 Exeter newsletter that announced the opening of Ye Old Stratum Hill Tavern at, at this site, the Keniston Tavern, and it was decorated on the exterior with orange and green awnings. And in that room, I think probably the room with the fireplace, the board of the fireplace had been moved, as, as Ron pointed out, there was seating for about 40 diners at, at sawbuck tables and benches. Alas, there are no photos of this. If any of you in your attics are harboring photos, <laughs> I'd love to see some. But uh, orange and green awnings made me wonder, like, is this a precursor of Howard Johnson? <laughs> okay. Now we're going to move reluctantly away from uh, 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 Keniston's Tavern. And I mentioned before that, that taverns were places where business and legal matters were uh, conducted. And one of the ways we find out about these things are ads. And this is an ad for a meeting <coughs> of the Bow proprietors at, at um, Mrs. Chase's. And Marsha will be talking about this um, more. One of the advantages of, of um, Chase's Tavern was that it was located near the meeting house. This is um, 
the, the meeting house or congregational church that was built in 1768. And this drawing, as the caption says, drawn from recollections of aged citizens. <laughs> and I mentioned how much taverns really just like, looked like anybody else's house. And uh, you can see that meeting houses also, yeah. except for the addition of the steeple, looked like, looked like my house, actually. <laughs> Ron's house and lots of others. Um, so uh, some of you might not know um, where uh, Chase's Tavern is, and, it's, and you drive by it probably many times during the day. And it is on Emery's Lane, which is where Portsmouth Avenue, um, before the bypass was built, passed within <coughs> feet of that front door, and it's a, approximately across from Sweet Dreams Bakery. So, at this point, I'd like to introduce our next feature, speaker, uh, Marsha Blaine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Blaine is a professor of history at Plymouth State University. She's currently interim director of the Museum of the White Mountains at Plymouth, and she's been a popular lecturer for the, for the uh, New Hampshire Humanities and their Humanities to Go program, especially her program on Stratum, I mean, on New Hampshire taverns. And tonight, she's going to build on that and bring it a little bit more local. Hi everyone. When I was uh, looking at um, the old provincial records, and if you don't know about the New Hampshire provincial and state, re um, state papers, I urge you to look at them. They're probably in the library. They're 40 volumes. Mm -hmm. And so when I began doing some research on women and power is what I was really interested in, <coughs> and how they related to the executive part of the government of uh, Colonial New Hampshire, I kept running across these tavern keepers. <laughs> they had to get a license from the government. So here's another woman. She was being paid by the government. What, what was going on with these people? And so I started gathering information about them, even though they weren't supposed to be part of what I was studying. And then I realized, actually, they fit right in. Because these women often were the center of power within a town, and the center often of power also over in Portsmouth. So we're going to be looking at Caverns and Stratum, and uh, Love Chase is our focus. <coughs> Most of you know about this particular map. It's a fabulous map. Actually, one of my favorite post-colonial maps, but not quite you know, in the modern era. And this picture of uh, this map of Stratum is from 1793, but I'm going to take you just a little closer so that we can also see that when we're looking kind of at the center of town, and I've got to get so Major Dudley Love Chase right here. And the tavern that Rebecca was just talking about, right close together. The people who ran taverns knew that if you want to have a successful tavern, you've got to be in a busy location. So location is, of course, extremely important. So when we're looking at women, you don't usually think of women running a tavern. And so I'm going to be looking with you at Love Chase a little bit more closely to figure out what was going on. So in a tavern, there was entertainment. And some people immediately go to, huh, that kind of entertainment? <laughs> but no, that's not the kind of entertainment, of course, that they were allowed to have. Um, by entertainment, they meant that people would come into the tavern and they would receive food and drink. And if they were strangers, they would receive a bed, to pl a place to sleep. It doesn't necessarily have to be a bed, by the way. Some place to sleep. They also have a place for the animals. That's what they're talking about when they're talking about entertainment. There was also licensing. And of course, when you think of licensing, this is going to the, the government of the, of the colonial and now the state government and asking for permission to run a tavern. You could not sell liquor without, by the glass or by the barrel if you did not have a tavern license. And so these people had to go and get a license. That was a choice. You could have decided that this was not what you were interested in. But you, if you went to them, you had to have that license. And if you got a license, you also had to have permission from your select board. So if the select board looked at you and said, are you kidding? You can't even keep your own family in line and you want to run a tavern? No way. I mean, they'd turn people away. But at the same time, they would also sometimes go to people and say, please, run a tavern. Where you are, we need a place for strangers in town. We also need a place where when people are paying, they can come and uh, rest in your tavern. Often taverns were also right next to the, as you can see here, to the meeting house. So you 
you go to church in the morning, you go to the tavern in the midday, and you go to church in the afternoon on Sundays. Often not to the minister's liking, because in the afternoon you might not be quite as attentive as you have been in the morning. But location, obviously, tremendously important. Also, they had to provide, if you think of women in tavern keeping, it was a place where women lived as well as worked. So if you had, uh, as one woman did, seven children under seven and an unknown number of children above that, I, seven children under seven, it just gives me the willies. <laughs> but if you did, you would be able to stay home and care for your children. So you can imagine somebody walking into the tavern, here's Love Chase, one child on her hip, another attached to her skirts, as she greets the person who's coming in, as she's you know, stirring whatever's on the fire, welcoming them, and then offering to serve them a drink. But it was also a public trust. Okay, think about the word a public house. It's licensed, it's open to the public, they have to accept anyone that comes, they have certain laws they have to follow, they are the place people go for news, they're a really important center. We don't think of women as running that kind of a central location, and yet they were some of the most trusted tavern keepers in New Hampshire. Also think of the word, uh, Rebecca was talking about this, the number of different names there are for taverns. One of them is a public house. In England, that's shortened to pub. And that's where that word came from. I always think that's kind of interesting to think about. But it's a public trust. You had to have... Your neighbors agree, oh, you've been a tavern for a year. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. So the tavern uh, keeper would be able to go back to the select board and say, I need to renew my license. Now, as Rebecca pointed out, not every tavern license still exists. If you go to the New Hampshire uh, archives, you can go looking through the court records. You can find the tavern licenses. But you can also see they're often on little odd sheets of paper that have gotten lost, some of them, over time. So knowing that somebody was a tavern earlier but not finding a tavern license for several years makes perfect sense. And then the thing that I think really is an oddity when you think of women in the colonial period, they had a voice of authority. Because if they could not keep control within their tavern, they would lose their license. It didn't happen very often. As a matter of fact, the only one I found between uh, 1690 and 1770 was a woman in England, uh, excuse me, in Portsmouth, named Elizabeth Wyberd. Wyberd had inherited her mother's tavern, and when she began running the tavern, she was young, she was inexperienced, she was, she was a recent widow too, so she apparently just came into the tavern, began running it, using the supply of liquor her mother had left behind, and one night a group of sailors got out of hand. <laughs> The, the out of handness spilled out into the streets, and so she lost her license. In the morning, the uh, governor and council said, you, you cannot keep a license anymore. In the afternoon, she went to the governor and council and asked to have her license back. She got it. <laughs> the only tavern keeper I know, only female tavern keeper I know, who was unable to use her voice of authority to be able to keep control of what was happening within her tavern. So women were able to do these things. They were able to do that in part because they were very good business people. They recognized the importance of the location. And you know from where the Chase Tavern is or where the Keniston Tavern is, they were on very important roads. These roads meant that they needed to have a place for strangers to stay as well as the food and drink that they needed. So these women were very savvy about running their taverns. So what can happen in a tavern? Well, I've, I've given you some examples from um, Love Chase's tavern. So from the treasury records that are in the New Hampshire archives in 1762, the account of payments of excise by tavern keepers and inn holders to the tavern, uh, to the tax collector. Uh, for Love Chase, it was two, she had sold 246 gallons and received, uh, the government received eight pounds, four shillings, zero pence which is misspelled, so sorry, uh, but 840 is my abbreviation for that from now on. She also sold 10 barrels of cider and received, uh, had to pay for that as well. So she paid the government 8 pounds, 16 shillings, and 6 pence. 
And again, you can also see the next year uh, that I found was 1765. In 1766, she was also paying for the liquor that was being sold. This, by the way, I'm going to leave uh, with Rebecca so she'll have all these records too. So what else was happening in a tavern? As Rebecca pointed out, there were meetings in taverns. And actually, as, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, the man who just spoke. Ron. Ron was very, that, that interesting, ta um, beautiful ceiling <coughs> in the Kennison Tavern, probably they were holding meetings up there. So there could be all sorts of meetings held in the tavern. There could be a tavern, uh, a meeting of proprietors of the Bow Town. Mm -hmm. By the way, that means that these people have invested in the town of Bow, and they're planning to make a killing by selling land in the town of Bow. For any of you who know about Bow and Concord, uh, there, there's a bit of overlap in the land that was granted, one by New Hampshire, one by Massachusetts. It was a mess. Uh, so the Bow proprietors met for years and years. A lot of times they were meeting in Love Chase's tavern. There were lots of other meetings that were held as well. Can I ask a question there yes. relative to the spelling? Sure. That interests me. Like Tuesday. T U E F. It's actually not an F. It's actually not an F. And it looks like an F to us, and we yeah. see it as an F. And my two students try to read it as an F, which does not work. It's actually an S. So if you look, you'll also see. It's also a regular S. Hey, yeah, no. <coughs> so here's a no notified is definitely an F, and they used one. It only has a little notch on that side, not on. Doesn't go all the way through. Like an F. Yes. Uh, where else can we see it? Love Chase. Here too. That S is an odd-looking one. Bushel. It's it, it's two different S's. Bushel. Yeah, stratum is another one. Yes. New Hampshire at the top. You can see an odd S there. So there are some oddities that went with it. Sometimes you'll see, uh, it's usually in the middle of a sentence, that they'll use that odd F S. Um, and if they're handwriting it, it goes down below the line just a little bit, with a little notch at the bottom, with a little bitty. And they only use it in the center. It's a business. Yeah. It's Why? It's a lower case. Mm -hmm. lower case. Okay. Even, even at the beginning of a set, you're writing the word set, you choose a regular S. I don't know. Okay, that's what it really has to You'll also see they have real odd uh, capitalizations, at least according to us. And they're using a more Germanic capitalization where they often just capitalize nouns for the heck of it. Um, not, not for any reason that I can see. For instance, on the fourth to the bottom line, see time and place. We wouldn't capitalize that. Uh, my students have such a great time. I bring in handwritten, and most of you know that students don't read handwritten and don't write with a cursive anymore. So I bring it in and I have to give it to groups of students to try to figure out what's going on there. But the spelling is different. Oh, come back. Come back. Um, it's okay, it just went to sleep for a second. The spelling is different, and also it has, um, you know, those odd, odd uh, FS's, and so you can see that there are some oddities that go along with 18th century, <laughs> moving into the 19th century spelling. I find it fascinating, too. My students find it frustrating. <laughs> So how, how can we know more? Another place that I've looked is not just the New Hampshire State Archives, which, by the way, I, I do need to remind all of us, it belongs to us. You may walk in there and ask for any of these papers at any point in time. They are there to serve you, and there are some utterly fascinating things in there. They have a vault, literally a vault, of 18th and 17th century records. Um, so I was allowed back there. They don't allow that anymore. When I was doing my research, and I would walk into the vault and go, I love musty old papers. <laughs> Those 18th century papers are just, it's, it's a fabulous place, so I urge you to go. But you can also see in the New Hampshire Gazette, there's a lot of information about taverns as well. So here in 1758, you'll see that they were having a tax sale on lands in Bow, uh, but the original rights will be sold at public venue, which is a public auction, to the highest bidder at the house of Mrs. Love Chase. So they would hold auctions also at various uh, inns, and this time they're calling a widow, inn holder of Stratum. 
and then they give the date, etc., and it's going to be continued until they're sold. Uh, New Hampshire Gazette also, 1759, so I'm down here. The committee that was settling the lines of bow, <laughs> which didn't happen in 1759, but it kept going on, and they needed a replacement member, and they're looking for the proprietors to meet at Love Chase's Tavern in 1760, and you, I just listed them after that, because the bow proprietors were at her tavern <coughs> So there are a lot of adjectives that um, the majority of the bow proprietors were people from Strata. And maybe some of your ancestors here were investors ah, in this. Good and, to know. Yeah, and also our very own Samuel Lane was the clerk of this whole operation. And so it was a convenient place for him to hold the meeting. But well, it also explains some of the connections with his tavern keepers, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, with the boat proprietors, they're a good example, I think, of also other towns doing that. Uh, my own town of Plymouth came from a lot of people who lived in Hollis. And so you'll find that the proprietors for Plymouth, who didn't have near the issues that Bo had, also were from a single town. That's a really interesting point. Did I see a hand up? Okay. And so, why was this happening at the tavern, I ask at the bottom? The other thing to think about is another place, another source is from Samuel Lane. That man's almanac is just a wealth of information. And living in Stratum, you know that very well. He wrote, Chase's Tavern on the Portsmouth Road was an important social and political center for Stratum. There were town meetings, electioneering could happen here, selectmen's meeting uh, business was held here. As a matter of fact, Charles Nelson said the selectmen made it their headquarters for the transaction of town business. In other words, it's a political center as well. Now, why weren't they meeting in the townhouse? Why weren't they meeting where you would expect them to meet? It was cold. <laughs> Think about it. This time of year, I mean, we're getting really close to town meeting time. The town, the town um, buildings are cold, and they weren't used on a regular basis, whereas usually pretty close by, there was a tavern that was warm. So sometimes they would even begin the meeting in the cold townhouse, adjourn it, and to a tavern where they would actually hold the meeting. And so clearly there's something going on here where Love Chase's tavern was a place where they liked to meet. It also says something, though, about their trust of her. So here she is. She's hearing what's going on within town. She knows all the nitty-gritty that's happening with her neighbors. As the select board is meeting, she and the people who work for her were walking in and out of wherever they were meeting, perhaps bringing a candle, food, certainly drink, putting wood on the fire, hearing all that was happening within the government. So how did Love Chase come to own the, the tavern, the Chase Tavern? Um, we know that she was the administrix of her husband's estate. And her husband, um, as far as I know, died without a will. And she, as the administrix of her, his estate, she was the one in charge of it. And she began running the tavern in her own name. Now, does that mean she hadn't run it before? No. She had run it before. She had probably been running it while he'd been doing a variety of other things. Seldom was a, an inn run as the sole source of income. When Rebecca talked about the domestic manufacture that women ran, there was a lot of different things that women could do and a lot of different things that men could do. Sometimes you'll see a tavern keeper, a male tavern keeper, listed as an inn holder. Sometimes you might see that same tavern keeper with a different title next to him. Maybe he was the ferry keeper. Maybe he ran, you know, he was known as a husbandman. Maybe any number of different jobs. It's not, like, like I call myself a teacher. That's what I do. But a person back then would have been a teacher, an innkeeper, and, and it goes on. So there are a variety of different jobs that go into it. Um, we also know how she came to own it from the New Hampshire Provincial and State Papers, which talk about the administration of Thomas's um, estate being granted to his widow. He was called, by the way, a yeoman. And remember, he ran the tavern. So he also had another name that was attached to him. And then we also, I did find the will, sorry about that. The will, the inventory of Thomas J's inholder. And look at what he owned. 
This, this is a very prosperous tavern. So this is 1757. He owned 10 acres and orchards that were worth 1,200 pounds. The tavern house itself, which was worth 1,500 pounds, the little probably red house, R-E-A-D, but R-E-D house, was worth 700 pounds, the barn 150, and then livestock worth 195, and then there was a bunch of wearing apparel that were listed, the utensils for running the farm, five beds and furniture, serving utensils, tableware, it had a total inventory of 5,234 pounds, eight pence zero, uh, eight shillings zero pence. This was a prosperous tavern. So when she moved into it, recognize she's coming into a very going concern. This was a, a, a different a business that was had been running well, and she probably had been one of the ones running it. <coughs> Again, as I mentioned, the, you know the baby at her hip, the child um, holding onto her skirts. She had probably been inside doing a bunch of the domestic work that needed to be do done. She was probably the most familiar face that they would see. So what was this woman doing in what was potentially the most disruptive business in town? Why did the town trust her? Or for that matter, why did they trust any other woman to do this business? So let's look at women and tavern keeping. <laughs> women and tavern keeping. We've mentioned there's a tremendous amount of government regulation. You need the town's permission. You need the central government's permission. There was tremendous competition. If you didn't run your tavern well, somebody would start a tavern close to you and you would be out of business. Or if the government discovered that you weren't running your tavern well, you'd be out of business. You had to run your tavern well, efficiently, and to the liking of your neighbors and your town and the central government. The licensing I've just mentioned, necessary every single year they had to get a renewal. And then you had to control drunken patrons. I mean, Elizabeth Wybird's drunken patrons might have spilled out onto the street, but most of them did not, which meant that women were able to keep control. Did they hire men to help? Well, maybe. But maybe they were able to do it from the force of their own personality as someone got out of, out of hand. The other thing that we often forget, although Rebecca mentioned it, uh, is that <coughs> taverns were a source of information. If you walked into a tavern, you might see a list of the latest um, laws that had been passed by the government. Or you might see a list of drunkards in town who could no longer be served. They did that too. Or you might see, here's the latest sermon, and the, you know, the minister wants you to read it. You know, the best place to post it is in the tavern. Or you might find that there's a newspaper. Maybe you don't read. Well, somebody would be sitting there reading the newspaper out loud. By the way, in New Hampshire, about 75% of all men and about 50% of all women, we estimate, were able to read by the time of the Revolution. So unlike uh, farther south you go, the lower the reading is. But that flow of information was constantly moving through this area. Now notice what we're mixing. Politics, religion, drinking, information where people could share the information. But well, women couldn't vote. Uh -huh. Okay, he was just asking, so women couldn't vote. Actually, I think I have a slide where I'm going to talk about that. Here. So, women couldn't vote. So, there actually were no laws that said women couldn't vote. There were no laws that said women couldn't As a matter of fact, the first law in the United States that said women couldn't vote was 1808. So let me talk about that very briefly. A femme soul, if you are a single woman, you are known as a femme sole, a woman alone. Yes, that's the old French spelling. It came over in 1066 uh, with, Norman, uh, with the Normans. A femme sole would be a woman before she got married, and she's really under the control of her husband, uh, excuse me, her father. She got married, she'd be under the control of her husband. But if she was a widow, she'd be a femme sole again. And a femme sole could own property, could sell, could sign contracts, could do almost anything a man could do. In many towns, she could vote. Now that blew me away. So I was in the uh, New Hampshire State Archives. I was going through some petitions. And we usually think of petitions as having gazillions of names on them. You could actually have a petition with a single person's name on it. It was a way of letting the government know what you needed from the government. Um, but 
these women were signing along with the men in their town, saying, here's what we need to do, we agree to this. So I have found women's names in odd places like that, usually on local matters. Remember, there were a lot of men who couldn't vote too, though. So what made some women able to vote and some not? She owned property. And that's what it comes down to. In New Jersey, for instance, after the revolution, single women who owned property could vote. And that law that I talked about was a New Jersey law in 1808 that said women could not vote. It was very, very exact. It was the only state that had allowed women to vote, and then they were cut off. Um, a femme covert was a woman who had married. And if you think of the word covert and covered, it's the same thing. It's as if they had drawn a, a whole veil over a woman, and she ceased to exist in the eyes of the law. As a matter of fact, William Blackstone said she suffered a civil death upon marriage. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds positively horrible, doesn't it? There was another, um, we've got single woman, we've got married woman, those two make sense. There was one that was very seldom used in the New World, and that was a femme sole trader. A femme sole trader was a woman who was actually married, but was able to conduct business in her own name. Now, I have seen a couple of places in um, Portsmouth where there was a woman who acted, at, who acted as femme sole traders. Um, not called that, but granted permission by the government to do it. But it did exist in a variety of places. On a more customary level, a woman could also be a deputy husband. Isn't that a great title? <laughs> so it's actually one that uh, ministers would use, and they would talk about the, the responsibilities of the deputy husbands in town. From 1690 to 1770, <coughs> there are a whole series of wars between the French and the English and their Native American allies. There are also a series of wars between the settlers and the Indians that were French allies. So there are a whole series of wars going on. So during the war season, which would be during the summertime, the men might be off at war, or they might be off cutting down wood. They were uh, lumbermen. Somebody's got to run the shop at home, uh, keep perhaps, uh, let's make it a little <coughs> lumberman is out, but he may have a mill. So who's going to sign the contracts? Who's going to run the business there at the mill? Or, if he is a tavern keeper, who's signing the contracts? Who's making sure that the goods are coming in and going out and the business is conducted? It's his wife. So we can find deputy husbands. These were women who were doing the job that we usually associate with um, men. And then widows. Once a woman was widowed and a femme soul again, she had the rights of a femme soul back. Now I skipped one. Does that answer your question, by the way? Yes. Okay. More completely than I ever knew, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if she were a widow, mm -hmm. would she have the right to inherit oh, yes. all that she and her husband had worked? She, she, mm, no, she didn't have the right to inherit all. A widow <laughs> received, by law, a third of her husband's estate. So let's suppose, um, if any of you read um, Martha Ballard, um, Sorry. Sorry. Midwife's Tale. Midwife's Tale. What's her name? Laurel, Laurel. Laurel Thatcher Ulrichs. If you read Laurel Thatcher Ulrichs' Midwife's Tale, you'll run into this. Because when uh, Martha Ballard's husband died, uh, not died, but was away, her son took over the house and she was relegated to one little place in the house. That happened to women. So the woman, uh, the husband dies. Uh, widow automatically inherits a third of his estate, but the other two thirds go to the children. So imagine you've got uh, a son who has inherited the house, except he's got to give you a third of it, and you and your daughter-in-law don't get along very well, and she gives you the shabbiest room in the front. That could happen, but they had to receive at least a third. Now, a husband could, however, write a will in which he could leave far more, could leave her the entire estate for her entire life or until she remarries, which was kind of the normal way of putting it. Did this so, go back to English common law? It goes back to English yeah. common law. Oh, it came okay. over. Exactly. If you go back to the 1641 Body of Liberties yeah. that was for Massachusetts, but it was also for us, um, you'll read those same laws. <laughs> you'll also read, by the way, that a, uh, a parent could actually 
a child could be put to death for disobeying a parent. Um, so there's some extreme laws in that body of <laughs> interesting laws. <laughs> That's true. Yes. So I did want to show you a couple of laws that go along with tavern keeping, and these are, are and they change the laws at will. You, know, you never know what kind of law is, is governing them at, at particular times. But in 1721, all licensed taverns within, within the state or the province of New Hampshire had to be constantly be provided with beer or cider for the refreshment of travelers under penalty of paying 10 shillings for every defect so often as they shall be found two days without it. Had to have liquor. <laughs> because remember, drinking water, water could be dangerous, they thought. Here in the New World, not so much. But coming from where they had and the understanding that they had, you had to have liquor. Um, if a public housekeeper refused to receive a traveler as a guest into his house or to find him victuals or lodging upon him rendering a reasonable price for the same, he is not only liable to render damages but may be indicted and fined at the suit of the state. So you also had to have not only the, the drink but you had to have food and lodging for travelers as well. <clears throat> Now, now, lodging, it, lodging it, as well. It's often just one room. And it often is just one room, and you might have five room. people in a bed. And, yeah. yeah, bed bugs would be joining you. <laughs> yeah, it could be for <laughs> some. I'm glad I was born now. Me too. <laughs> uh, there's a tavern over in uh, Portsmouth that I was studying, and it was full of bolsters, tons and tons of bolsters. But these were the kinds that were rolled up, and in the evening could be unrolled. So uh, it's also a place that the uh, provincial government was meeting. So imagine you know, the New Hampshire State House full of beds, rolled up beds, and that's how they did it. So they could have uh, lodging in any room of the house as well. In 1716, there was a law that forbade tavern keepers to serve any apprentice, servant, or Negro without permission of the master. No local inhabitant was to uh, sit drinking or tippling after 10 at night or to continue there above the space of two hours. <laughs> Are the laws you were to follow. Okay, so we talked about the statutes as they applied to women. And let's look at the statutes required of la uh, licensed tavern keepers. So you had to provide food and drink that we just talked about. You had to provide bed for travelers, lodging also for horses, oxen, whatever you rode in on, in other words. You had to post the list that we talked about. These were required. These are requirements that the government required. You had to pay excise taxes on the liquor. It was really important, by the way. Even back then, it covered half the expense of the provincial government. Some things don't change. <laughs> you had to control the drinking time, as you just saw in that 1716 uh, law, and that law you'll see repeated a number of times. You had to keep the Sabbath laws. Okay, so the Sabbath laws, a little flexible over time. They were open on <coughs> Sabbath because it was a warm place. Sometimes you were allowed to serve liquor. Sometimes you were not. It appears they almost always did. Um, <laughs> But there are a variety of different Sabbath laws, and so they could vary time to time. You had to keep good orders. Uh, so if um, in one tower license I read that was the, the mother had just died and the son was inheriting the uh, tavern, and they said that the tavern can go to this individual because his mother had kept good orders. It's the only time I've seen, by the way, a tavern license refer to the previous tavern, tavern owner as the reason the next one's getting it, which I just keep wondering, what happened next? What happened next? <laughs> so she had to keep, or he had to keep, good orders within the tavern. And they also had to market their business. Now, that's not a legal requirement, but if they didn't market it, they wouldn't end up with that wonderful estate like Love Chase was in charge of. They also had to buy and sell. You needed the food, you needed the drink, you needed to keep the linens. Linens were a huge expense during this time. So you need to keep those things up to date. You need to hire people. Uh, if you ran a particularly large tavern, you might need several individuals helping you in the tavern. So you, there's a lot of things that were happening in the tavern. 
And then there were customary things that happened within taverns. You provided accommodations for the town and the business, as clearly Love Chase's tavern was doing for Strata. You, there were domestic duties that happened on a regular basis, so you know, the cleaning that goes along with it, making sure that the outhouse is up to, up to snuff, uh, making sure you've got food, such as it might have been, making sure there's drink, making sure that things are clean enough. Uh, their standards of cleanliness were not quite ours. They also were sources of news, and that was something that was expected. If you went into a tavern and they did not have a newspaper or something to read or listen to, you, you weren't going to stay in business very long. They also had to accommodate meetings, but also music. Um, they, they might have music there, they might have lectures. I could actually see that happening with the Kenison Tavern. I can imagine that ceiling would be great for music. They might have had dances as well. This is before the Victorian period, so there were dances. Uh, so there were a lot of things that would happen uh, within a tavern. And again, remember, it was a public trust, according to custom. Hello. There. And then, so the public house, my book here, the public house was truly public. It was a highly regulated business. It involved market forces and state authority. And there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Since from all that Marcia has been saying, how remarkable Chase's Tavern is, and it's quite amazing that we still have it with us here today. I just want to um, exit the whole Chase Tavern thing, reading from Richard Scammon's account of, of the Chase's Tavern. Um, he said, there was never a more genial landlord than Major Dudley Chase. He was the son of Love Chase who took over after her, although I think they probably sort of overlapped. Um, I, I mean, I know they overlap, but uh, her son, Major Dudley Chase, was fond of music and played the flute with skill. He had roughed it about the world as a sailor. He had ardently embraced the cause of the revolution. He entered the service as a company fifer and had come out of the retreat from Ticonderoga in a somewhat dilapidated condition. He managed to pull himself together after that and he rose through the ranks of the Continental Army, finally uh, leaving the Army in 1780. He died in 1815. However, this is kind of a mystery. In 1802, Love Chase's of uh, Will left the property to her grandson Andrew, Dudley's son. So we don't really know quite what was going on there. Maybe, maybe uh, Dudley was getting a little dilapidated. I don't know. But anyway, in 1829, um, Andrew Chase sold the property to Joseph and Sophronia Emery. And here we begin the saga of the Emery <coughs> family at this property. Um, and this is uh, the, the uh, fireplace in the front left room, which was probably the bar room um, when it was run as a <coughs> But you can see it's been uh, converted now to have a stove. And you can also see that um, to the side there, the oven had in the 1840s acquired a cast iron door. And these are seen in many houses here in Stratum. These were cast at a foundry in what was called <laughs> South, um, South Newmarket, which is Newfields. And then going through the front hall, you can see some changes that were made um, in the Emory period, in the more federal period. And in the other front room, on the other side of the house, a, a very federal uh, style mantelpiece. Although the hearth and, and, and the shape of the, of the <coughs> firebox is probably more 18th century there. And the ceiling of this room um, has the same kind of, has the sort of beams and moldings that would have been of the, of the earlier era. So they just kind of gussied up the mantelpiece but left the rest of the room pretty much. This was probably a meeting room. Um, it kind of goes from the front to the back of the house. And going upstairs, we come to a room that's kind of the equivalent of that lovely room at the Keniston Tavern with a beautiful cove ceiling. This room has on its uh, south wall 
uh, a lot of paneling and doors and so forth. And again, it goes front to back. So um, with this degree of paneling, it probably was also used as sort of a meeting room or you know, a public room for um, that sort of activity. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about, this is a very boring slide, I'm sorry, but it, it actually is kind of interesting because it's not quite symmetrical there, but so I, I really want to get an architect or somebody who's done that to have a look at that and see what's going on. But um, the Emory Farm is worth mentioning here. Uh, John Emery began market gardening on this property in, the, in 1850. He was reportedly the first in Stratum to undertake that kind of uh, farming, market gardening, in a modern fashion. He was famous for strawberries in particular. And his son, uh, J. Fred Emery, took over the business. And he moved into the old homestead on his wedding day in 1896. And in 1919, he began his roadside farm stand, which was reportedly the first in our area. And I'm sure many of you uh, remember uh, Fred Emery and his farm stand. And he was, uh, he was known as a co what I would call an old codger. <laughs> he was a very colorful character and particularly known for versifying on any occasion. Uh, but on his younger years, he was very active in politics and he was uh, he started out, one of his first jobs was being janitor when they, when they built the town hall across the way, but he went on to become a selectman being in the uh, House of Representatives and so forth. Um, and he was, in fact, a selectman at the time when the town accepted the gift of Stratton Hill, which becomes Stratton Hill Park. But Richard Scammon, in writing in 1899, noted the passing of taverns. The railroad had come, for one thing. Public convenience no longer required the roadside tavern. Adverse public sentiments suppressed the bar, and neither has since existed in the town. But that was not quite true. Hospitality in a different form could still be found in Stratum. This is a picture of, of an inn, hotel, whatever, called the Elms. It was also called Elmwood. And this photo, we believe, is dated from the 1880s. And it's, it's, it was known for uh, providing country stays to people who would come for the, the waters. There was, uh, there was a sulfurous well behind here. And they actually sold it in big stoneware jugs. And you could take it away with you. You could stay there and drink it. But this is so interesting. Because you see these, these people, uh, guests arrayed on the, on the upper and lower porches. And, gentleman about to head off in this nice little buggy and I love over on the left hand side um, at the bottom there's a woman in a, a shirt waist with a tie and a long skirt about to head off on her bicycle which on those dusty roads must have been quite an adventure <laughs> and uh, Ron mentioned the the uh, Portsmouth Avenue was paved with concrete in 1929 and it was about that time that um, True Roby took advantage of this new modern road to set up Roby's cabins. And these were where Stratton Hill Stone is today. A um, little, what we kind of think of as a motor court kind of thing. I love the little sort of windmill or lighthouse picture there. And they're advertising that they were clean, wholesome, and up to date. <laughs> Of course, the early, as Marcia mentioned, the early taverns were required to provide for their guests horses or other livestock. Not only what you might have rode in on or you know, had hitched up to your wagon, but I imagine also people were driving livestock from towns like Stratton up to the market square in Portsmouth. Um, so if you were stopped and you had, you know, if you steer with you, you expected them to be able to be fed and watered in the tavern. But, we get into the 20th century, people didn't want need uh, hay and water, they needed gasoline. And uh, this is one of the first uh, gas stations um, located where a gas station was recently removed, sort of next to the CVS there. Um, and it was run um, by Arthur and Ida La Violette um, from uh, circa 1935. So I, I looked in the town directories and they were still listed there um, through, the, through the 1950s. So 
Uh, maybe some of you could we tell us. We said La Violet. La Violet, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, and then finally, we see. It was fill it up and put a quart of oil in. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody was burning oil. <laughs> um, this is a is a, a photo that appeared in a kind of economic development brochure sometime in the early 1950s, and it says Sunset Farm, a pleasant farm boarding house on Winnicott Road. This is um, this is a um, the Nathaniel Wigan House, which is at 58 Winnicott Road, just down this way. And this is a way, this, as farm stays became popular in New Hampshire, both before and after World War II, and it was a way for farms to add, uh, make some money, add value to a farm. And this was at a time when market gardening in Stratum and elsewhere in New England was beginning to decline. So you had people living on farms that wasn't produ weren't producing quite as much income, or that farmers had become elderly. This was one way um, that, that, that they could continue to keep operating. And finally, I'd like to say, after you've heard about all these wonderful taverns, perhaps you feel somewhat like envious of, of, the, of our forebears that had places to gather for conviviality, to conduct business, to discuss the affairs of the day, and to create community. I hope that somehow, sometime in our near future, Stratum can develop places where residents and visitors to Stratum can meet as strangers and leave as friends and neighbors. The man that is drunk is void of all care. La 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 The Moor's poison dart he scorns for to wield His bottle alone is his sword and his shield Ba la 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 ba la 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 la